so this particular um, module was all about case studies and broadly in conservation so um, so it's not a really big module so I have a few conservation related questions and then I'll move on to uh, some of the MCQs that we did not cover during the previous lectures as well so we can have like a semi recap as well to uh, older modules So what is the date for the exam? Is it the 27th, 29th? No update yet. Then oh. 28 and 29 I think. I but see. But I, I don't know what will be the final date. I see. So it's online in some center or something like that? What do you mean by online? I mean it's uh, like or it's pen computer? and paper. Yeah. No, it will be computerized. Computerized, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have no idea. When did be our last session for problem problem solving session? Uh, it's probably going to be uh, so this week. There is, uh, I mean, this is the eleventh one. The next week. It should be the next week, yeah. So that will be 25th. Yeah, I guess after that we can't have one, right? Because it will be after the exam. Okay. Uh, yeah, so Can Jobin's... Yeah, Govind, your voice is a little faint. Can you hear me now, ma'am? I can hear you, but it's... Yeah, okay. Uh, no, I'm on full volume, actually. How about now, ma'am? Yeah, a little better. I was wondering if uh, when we get the exam dates. Yeah, I was just asking actually if uh, <laughs> to, what, what are the exam dates. I uh, I really have no idea. I um, I think it should be. I'm assuming it's the 29th, but let me just look up. Uh, I thought I did see some sheet somewhere. What is this NPT? Just a feedback. Yeah. I, I do not know whether you are you are able to maybe communicate it back to the exam center or the relevant people. Yeah. But having exam details or exam center details in just last week is too tedious and to manage all the logistics at least for the students. Sure. For example, now. Uh, I'm finding it very difficult to manage all the other stuff with the exams. Because I'm not able to get the uh, details of it where it is going to happen or a hall ticket is not at come, ma'am. Have you actually written to NPTL? Yes, yes ma'am. NPTL, I have mailed it twice, ma'am. Because uh, and no, no reply. Uh, being a housewife, I have a lot of commitments, ma'am. And uh, between all this, I do the post and uh, is I there, to be, I'm answerable to many, ma'am. I, I, I understand. Is the registration actually still open for the exams? No, ma'am. It's closed. Or it's over? Yeah. Okay, so then... It was over by 20, 20, yeah, 20 March. It was over by way back. I'm not yet received any oh, information. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, I don't yeah, know. I thought I saw something. No, I'm just checking up and my email. And also we got like a mail friend. saying that the course is ended and the results have been... Uh, uh, results are available now. So the course is ended. That's what I got a mail, ma'am. Okay, I have a, uh, an email. One second. Let me just open this. Uh, this ornithology basic course in ornithology 12 weeks april 29th it's written 
I don't know if you have gotten this email. It's written exam format April two thousand twenty three. Yeah, ma'am. But uh, I'm saying about the hall tickets and the center which has been chosen, ma'am. Yeah. So Because it is on the twenty ninth, right? So that is okay, right? The date is. Yeah, that. And uh, not the date, ma'am. But I'm saying the center and every other stuff, ma'am. That's yeah, why. Yeah, actually, I'm I'm not at all linked to NPTEL, but uh, I can ask the course coordinators. If That's what they uh, won't have uh, any idea. I didn't idea. mean that you you are related to it. We are just putting forth some idea. I to I can. Who is yeah, I can just drop in a message and yeah, hopefully you can. Uh, yeah, you would get some information. I actually I would say just write to NPTEL, but since NPTEL is not responding, I'm not sure what would be any other way to get a response. But uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. At least so ten days before ahead, we have to get the hall ticket, ma'am. So those who are like have to travel or something. Yeah, yeah. Something. You need to know what the locations are. Sure, sure. Ah, uh, okay. So uh, this is. Uh, I was just telling everyone who had joined earlier that we'll be covering a few questions from the previous lectures as well because this module is like a little short and it's mostly case studies. So a little bit of revision also will be done. So I'm just going to put up the first question. uh so which species is not listed as critically endangered in india or i mean critically endangered is it the great indian bustard the forest starlet the jordan scurzo or the bengal florican Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. You you mentioned something about getting an email that the course is concluded. I didn't get such an email. Yeah, I have got it. I can share the screenshot later to your mails. But uh, I got the mail saying that the uh, um, uh, course is over, and uh, thanks for uh, being with us. And uh, you can still access uh, this uh, all these you know, uh, info and uh, videos and all in my courses. That's what I got. I I actually I got a bit uh, anxiety. Uh, already the exam has started over because ah uh, exam the no uh, results were uh, published. That's what I got. I can email you if you want. Sorry, what results are published I, if the exam is not over? Okay, I think we can maybe you guys can talk about this like later. Uh, no, ma'am. I got an email from NPTEL saying that the course is over. Uh, the results have been got. So uh, thank you for being with us. The thank you mail I got from NPTEL, even though I have not yet got the. Uh, It the might be itself. it might be just the evaluation based on the MCQs of whatever was coming every week. I'm not sure, but yeah, that's it's okay. okay. Okay, so okay. has everyone uh, finished answering this? I see only three replies. No one, no one knows any of these birds. They are so common. Uh, Ma'am, I mean, uh, uh, the criteria for critically endangered. One second, let's just get to the answer first. If everyone has gotten it. Uh, also, ma'am, how will we get the hall ticket through mail or through? I'm assuming it should definitely come through mail. It, I don't think it will come by post. Okay, so two say uh, forest starlet, one of you say Jordan scurzor, two of you say the Bengal florican. Okay, so uh, yeah, Govan. All four of them are very uh, uh, close to critically endangered, even if one of them might not actually be listed as one, right? uh no not really i mean uh, the forest starlet is not critically endangered and it is really? listed as only endangered in fact there are a lot of individuals of the forest starlet that are present in the wild and uh, it is quite commonly seen across its uh, dry deciduous landscape so there are a couple of papers that have in fact just today a paper has let me uh, share this with you has come out uh, uh, um, based on the forest starlet uh, it's come out by a collaboration of people in our lab and uh, sacon 
in Coimbatore. Yeah, let, let me just share that paper with you so you could get and I'll just share this tweet. Yeah, you can look at uh, what are the habitat determinants of uh, I'm going to share this Copy. What's the reliable source for list of these critically endangered species? Oh, you or? can IUCN IUCN Okay Yeah, you can just look at the IUCN statuses and usually like I not usually I think all of it is uh, updated on Wikipedia so even if you go to Wikipedia and you see the panel with the bird it will show you uh, uh, what in the IUCN category it is listed as so can someone tell me what are the criteria or uh, what is the criteria for a critic to list a species as critically endangered yeah Lakshmi you can go ahead yeah, critically endangered one species are those which are showing a con uh, consistent decline in the population and uh, uh, there are not much of uh, newer generation as well as there is a, a, a pretty a reduction in, a, in its range also. So, so slow, um, uh, slow uh, reproduction, uh, reduction in range and decline in population is the criteria to uh, ascertain whether uh, it's a critically endangered or not okay so basically it, it yeah you are correct but to add a few more numbers to it so it has a decline in population by 80 to 90 percent that is crucial because other percentages will go into other categories like endangered near threatened or uh, the uh, subsequent categories that are below this and uh, this is from umesh's lecture as well uh, it has a geographic distribution that is uh, between uh, is between 10 to less than 100 square kilometers and the number of individuals are also very less about 50 to 200 of them and uh, when such an evaluation is done already and it is found to fit in the category yeah, Rajeshri has put that in. Uh, when it has, uh, when it fits into this category, it is listed as critically endangered. So, what is above critically endangered? Uh, uh, nearly threatened. I'm sorry, uh, endangered. I mean, extinct, ma'am. Extinct in wild. Yeah, yeah. So, what is the difference between extinct and wild and extinct? Extinct in wild. Um, sorry, you can go if you want. Uh, you go. I, I say don't answer. Now you say. Okay. Extinct in the wild refers to the fact that uh, species might not, might no longer be present in the wild, but might still reside in captivity. Uh, uh, viable male or viable female only is available. One uh, very uh, one pair or two pairs are available. Yeah. One? Even I think if one, I mean, if it even if it is not like reproductively. Uh, active even if there's just one individual yeah in captivity it is yeah still extinct in the wild but not uh, completely extinct i can't remember i think there was a the white rhino example i'm not sure if they are no, i can give a bird example uh yeah i'm talking about like very few like do you have any ones with very very few of them uh it's called the spix ma'am. have you heard of it oh okay okay and which zoo is it in um, I think the uh, captive individuals are found around the world, but uh, they are none of them are in the wild. Oh, I see, I see. Okay. They, they were taken multiple times from for the, uh, from pet the breed. wild. For the, exactly, man. Have see. you watched some Disney movie or some, uh, sorry, some movie called Rio? Uh no, I haven't seen it. I've just uh, it's yeah, a, it's, it's that's, that's the uh, the it's about the, yeah, it's right. about the bird. <laughs> okay. Okay, cool. Uh, okay, let me just go to the next question. Uh, so, what are the factors that don't result in a species becoming rare? Is it uh, large geographic distribution, large body size, la uh, high trophic level, high being in a highly fragmented habitat, or all of the above? I'm sure in the last option, we none of the above uh, well, now it's all of the above, so. Um, 
again about the white rhino uh, you mentioned the white rhino right no yeah it's actually a subspecies called the northern white rhino correct correct yeah yeah they have the northern and the southern yeah uh, the southern white rhino is actually doing i, I wouldn't say it's doing great but it's man, it's doing it's still in the wild yeah now. yeah yeah the northern white rhino there are only two two individuals left yeah i think and both are females or something right Yes, ma'am. The male yeah. died in 2018. Yeah. Ah, uh, the only the females are left. Yeah. They're planning to they're planning to use in vitro fertilization to. Yeah, the they're trying to. They've been trying to do artificial insemination, but they have not really been successful. And another, I think, idea was to do. uh in vitro fertilization and uh, when a viable embryo is formed to try and put it in a host uh, southern white rhino to see if they are able to uh, exactly yeah. that's exactly what yeah. what they're trying to do yeah yeah i don't know if it's been unsuccessful cuz i i heard that some embryos have been formed uh yeah yeah they have been first they did try artificial artificial insemination but i don't think that worked but they did collect yeah but for a large species it's uh quite difficult like a large mammal species uh things like this become much more tricky than for uh smaller uh species that have like very uh small gestation time and all uh okay so uh yeah a is actually the correct answer can someone like give some comments on the other uh, uh points that are given out here yeah sure go on um large body size can result in a species becoming rare as the as a large bodied animal would definitely need lot a lot more space and area to survive in a lot more resources to sus- to sustain itself and would also be rather sensitive to the environment uh, all, and they are and large bodied animals also tend to have a very slow uh, uh, uh gestation period or turnover ratio and which which um, which results in them population being uh, slow to recover okay. and right and high trophic levels species which are ha- on the higher trophic levels are a na- a na- tend to naturally be rarer than those on the lower trophic level and and they are and they are often more the most vulnerable when a population when uh, when the environment is uh, when there's some kind of disturbance like for example top predators like tigers or uh, lions or or birds of prey like raptors are often on the highest in decline when uh, i are often the highest in decline and in in a highly fragmented habitat uh, when habitat is fragmented um as the the set fragments or pieces become uh, low in uh, resources and tend to become cut off the there's a reduction both in the number of species and the interaction between species in the remaining fragments which leads to a lot of species becoming rare Sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, regarding the last point, there's something more to add, but we can add it in the next question. But yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for explaining this. Um. Okay. Is it not going? Yikes. Okay. So, which of the following species do not have captive breeding programs? Uh, the Great Indian Bustard, the Jordan Scorzer, the Bengal Florican, White Rumped Vultures, Lesser Florican, or the Indian Goza. I'm going to wait till all of you reply. And then we can discuss. More, more than one answer, right now. Uh, sure. You can list uh, more of them. If you feel there are, yeah, it's a multiple, multiple choice.
Okay, bunch of F F D F D D F. F B E. F B E is that F B E Govan? Yes, ma'am. Okay, okay. And some on this list do necessarily require captive breeding programs, right now? No, we're just talking about here black and white. Do they have captive breeding programs or do they not have captive breeding programs? Okay, so now we can discuss uh, what. The, okay, so no one has chosen A, which is the Great Indian Bustard, because it does have a, a captive breeding program. I think it has two sites or one site, I can't remember. But uh, yeah, it has been successful in uh, producing yeah uh, offspring of the GIBs via this program. So that is, uh, um, they do have a program. Uh, <laughs> the Jordan Scozer, uh, only Govan has chosen the Jordan Scozer. So the <laughs> Jordan Scozer does not have a captive breeding program because we don't have the bird itself, right? So you can't have a captive breeding program without the bird. Mm, the Bengal Florican uh, does have a captive breeding program. White rum vultures also do have a program. The Lesser Florican also does have a program. And the Indian Koza does not have any captive breeding programs. So your correct answer is actually supposed to be B and F. Yeah. Okay. So dash describes the random fluctuations in population size that occur because the birth and death of each individual is discrete and a probabilistic event. What is this term known as? Okay, uh, Sachin's putting an answer. Okay, Rajeshri and again Sachin has given another option. Uh, Rajeshri, would you like to uh, uh, describe this? Like tell us something more about this. So yes, you are correct. It's actually uh, demographic stochasticity only. No, uh, you could even type if you want. Okay, so uh, which kind? Okay, so basically, uh, as uh, they have mentioned, demographic stochasticity basically tells you about the fluctuation in populations. And uh, yeah, go in. Could I take a crack at explaining? Man? Sure. Demographic stochasticity refers to the process or the process by which 
the population goes through random fluctuations uh, through due to several factors that, which influences both the birth rate and the death rate. Like for example, um, a sudden spread of disease or a sudden uh, a local catastrophe might influence death rates. Uh, and certain uh, factors like resources availability might in, might influence birth rates. These factors care. These factors uh, affecting the population's birth and death rates are uh, are what is called as demographic stochasticity. The effect of these uh, varies depending upon the size of the population. A large population uh, can recover quickly from any changes in uh, demographic stochasticity, but a small population is more vulnerable to it. Sure. Yeah. 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 You are correct. Uh, smaller populations are much more susceptible to demographic stochasticity. Mm, okay. Okay, so uh, there was a case study, uh, I think it was Umesh's uh, lecture only, that uh, looked at f uh, effects of fragmentation uh, in the Panama Canal. So, uh, can someone explain to me actually what had happened during the formation of the Panama Canal to add Bar Colorado Island and how did that affect the biodiversity on the island? Uh, yeah, Sachin, go ahead. I think during the construction of Panama Canal, the the low lying area or the forest area had I think a decline and the jaguar or the top predator in that uh, had declined. That has impacted uh, the population of meso predator if I'm not wrong. The the ones who were actually uh, predating on the ground nest or of the birds and all these things. So those may include um, uh, 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 those kind of uh, uh, animals which were feeding on the bird's nest. So because of that, the population of the birds declined. So it was actually an indirect uh, uh, impact from the top predator to the other species. Okay. So that's what has been explained in this uh, fragmentation. Uh, because, yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, Sachin. Uh, so I think Sachin has summarized uh, what uh, the gist of the story is. But uh, let's break it down a little more. So what? How was this habitat fragmentation caused? Yeah, go ahead. Only, only that part. It was caused due to flooding, ma'am. Correct. Uh, so during the, of the Panama. Yeah. During flooding, what had happened? Oops, I lost you. Hello? The creation of yeah. the Panama Canal led to immense flooding of the forest and the it led to the flooding of the forest and all low lying areas. Yeah. And some uh, mildly elevated areas were became an island. Correct. And Bar Bar Colorado Island. Correct. Yeah. So, uh, Barrow Col Colorado Island is basically a higher elevation forested site. So, that's why it remained above the water and it became actually an island. So, now, uh, why was there an absence of top predators like jaguars? A lack of uh, space and resources. Uh, uh, a jaguar needs a large territory. Uh, to survive and, uh, and a single small island like that would not be sufficient for him. Correct. Yeah. So, because of restrictions to uh, habitat territory size, these uh, large carnivore top predators cease to exist on the island. So, that just uh, allowed the next in line, the meso predators, such as uh, I can't remember, I think it was Kuwaitis, Agoutis. What was it? I can give examples, ma'am. Yeah, sure. Ocelots, Jagarandis, Coatis. Yeah. Uh, so these three species had uh, uh, proliferated a lot, and because of the proliferation of these species, their food type 
which is basically uh, i think a lot of like ground nesting birds and their uh, eggs etc they seem to be predated on so uh, what is this an example of what would you call the study system this particular description what is it an example of there is a term for this when something from a high trophic level affects trophic cascade yeah so it is called a trophic cascade so here actually the jaguars are not interacting with the ground dwelling ground nesting birds indirectly but their absence is causing them to decline in number because something happening in the level in between right so this is a example of a trophic cascade which is very similar to the yellowstone national park example that uh, covers uh, these uh, what was it the wolves yeah mm, okay so here you have two graphs and uh, what exactly is highlighted in the graphs present out here can someone okay you can take like 2 uh, minutes to look at the graph in detail and then try and take a stab at explaining what is actually happening here Does anyone else want to like to uh, take a stab at explaining? Uh, could I, ma'am? One second, Govind. Anyone else? Yes, Karnika. So, uh, this this is trying to explain a. Um, Uh, uh, yeah, as I said, the population mismatch, and uh, in the presentation, as Omid and Dr. Omid also highlighted, that one of the effects of climate change, and when uh, it's when the, the the onset of the heat, onset of summer, is uh, earlier than usual, there is there is a mismatch of events that are happening, and um, and so in the first graph, there is a certain rhythm. to uh, when the eggs are laid and uh, you know exactly at what time the uh, the, the caterpillars are at their uh, you know their peak in availability right. exactly at the time when the chicks also need the most amount of food but let's suppose if there is a lag in uh, the laying uh, you know in, in in the availability of uh, the caterpillars as against uh, when they actually need it would would have repercussions either the chicks uh, may not uh, get the food that they need and they'll be malnourished and uh, yeah yeah that. yeah so yeah thanks for the uh, uh, explanation karnika so yeah you are uh, absolutely correct so there is like uh, this is uh, yeah rajeshree is also put it in it's a phenological mismatch that is uh, basically resulting due to climate change and uh, climate change patterns that uh, are affecting food availability so out here they have given us the example of only the uh, bird and caterpillar uh, abundance rates uh, the frequency or abundance rates of presence of these uh, two um, trophic levels but there is actually another step to this as well uh, could you guess could anyone guess what it is ma'am what do you mean by another step so right now we're talking about the uh, bird and the bird that is consumed uh, co- that is consuming the caterpillar so here there are two systems that are given it's the caterpillar and the bird but there is another system that is resulting or triggering this change uh, climate yes but climate is doing what first that results global in global warming uh, no hang on 
क्लाइमेट इज डूइंग वॉट दैट रिजल्ट इन कैटेपिलर बायोमस फूड नो नो इट्स नॉट फूड इनसिक्योरिटी फूड इज अवेलेबल बट फूड इज अवेलेबल लाइक इन द सेकेंड ग्राफ फूड इज अवेलेबल अर्लियर करेक्ट फूड एज इन फूड फॉर द बर्ड इज अवेलेबल अर्लियर सो वाई इज फूड फॉर द बर्ड अवेलेबल अर्लियर करेक्ट एंड वाई आर द कैटेपिलर्स कमिंग आउट अर्लियर because the change of climate the global warming yeah so what is the actual link like suppose it becomes very hot caterpillars are coming out rain. earlier rain uh okay rain okay climate okay think of think of something else like this particular process in the food chain think of nature okay you're thinking of all variables sure that is correct but that is leading to something that Flowers. is your 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 clothes yeah correct i'm just going to mute shravan uh yeah so uh uh yeah not not migration okay so this climate change is basically causing uh um new leaves and flowers to come earlier right so spring is getting preponed and these are mostly studies that are done in uh, the temperate regions and they use the examples of um caterpillars that feed on oak trees and there is something known as oak bud burst which is basically the new leaves which is what caterpillars eat because when the leaves become older the secondary metabolite levels increase in it and the uh, the caterpillars eat those leaves uh, in lesser quantities so they have to time their uh, or the insects have to time their arrival in uh, such a way that they have access to fresh green leaves right so now since the oak uh, leaves the new oak leaves are coming earlier the caterpillars are also coming earlier and there is a peak in the presence of caterpillars much earlier than usual right so now uh, there is one more thing that is important out here so let's go to the first graph let me just try and get my so is that clear about the oak i mean or the plant presence that is influencing the caterpillar peak uh, yes ma'am could you just uh, just mention what is oak bud burst again okay i i'll just share a paper one second uh oak bud burst is basically just when new leaves are coming out uh, they measure uh, basically uh, the arrival of new leaves so actually the scientists they go and they look at one twig on a tree consecutively across several days in the season so basically they shed all their leaves during winter and this new leaves start coming in during spring and they'll keep on observing that twig and mark at what stage these leaves start budding out of the tree so basically it's nothing but a measure of uh, timing of the leaves bro. correct correct uh, okay this is just a blog i'm just going to put the link in here so that you can read whenever you want um i hope this is yeah i've not read this but yeah so this is a little bit fast track so whitham woods in oxford are uh, it's a long term monitoring site for blue tit populations and this is where they have been doing long term phenological studies over i think several tens of years i think maybe like probably like 40 50 or more uh, yeah not even close okay but now let us focus on uh, yikes is it thing on let's focus at the first graph and you see uh, so how many times do, do these uh, let's say blue tits how many times do they lay eggs in a year as per year it is 
twice? Yeah, as per this graph, it is twice, right? So you can see two peaks. So this is uh, the laying dates. You have so it is a bimodal distribution. You have one peak during the first of May, and then you have one peak during the first of June. So that is correct. Now you see that the caterpillar biomass is coinciding with the peak of the eggling period for the second brood, right? So what is this caterpillar peak uh, advantageous for? Who is it advantageous for? The red chicks. Which chicks from which brood? Is it from oh, the, the second, late, late brood. the second brood? Yeah. Okay. Does uh, any? Uh, yeah. Why not? Okay. It can also be useful for the first breed. I mean, when they become adult by that time, I think they can also <laughs> feed on that. It's useful for the first brood right now. The, the first brood has hatched by the by the time. Uh, actually, the second brood because the successive rate uh, will be higher uh, for the second brood because uh, they get the food. Parent, uh, parent bird co collects the food. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. So I think so, everybody is split between first brood and second brood. There is no consensus out here. So let's look at it a bit more. Uh, what is the average gestation period for a bird egg? Incubation period, not gestation period. Incubation period. Uh, mm, that's a little less, but uh, yeah, it's about 21 days on an average. 20 to 21 days is the uh, usual incubation period for, let's say, like this bird is like a blue tit. Okay, so now having this information, tell me. Which brood is this caterpillar biomass peak more advantageous for? Ma'am, uh, blue tits are altricial. No, they are precocial. So, so their uh, gestation would take a bit longer, right, ma'am? Uh, no, it's average. It's the same time. Just altricial and precocial just means that when they hatch, are they? Do they need to have a lot of parental care? Can they like run around and move around? or do they have but feathers or not it does not alter the gestation period so the gestation yeah. period is roughly the same then i well i figured that if an altricial uh, a chick would hatch sooner than a precocial chick i mean it makes sense right now the, but here the, we are talking uh, about only precocial chicks because this is for precocial chicks altricial chicks don't eat like probably worms or anything yeah i don't know but let's say this is a passerine and uh, I hope everyone knows that only chicks eat caterpillars and soft bodied matter and as they grow uh, older uh, it's mostly they eat insects and other uh, animals or insects with exoskeletons etc. Not just caterpillars. But caterpillar food requirements are highest for chicks. Okay, so now given this information, tell me uh, whether this uh, in the first graph, the caterpillar biomass peak is advantageous for the first brood or second brood? The, the first brood. Right. So that is so. So now you see that uh, when they hatch, they need the uh, caterpillar, but for the second or the late brood, only for the early broods it is advantageous, but after that it kind of like there is no uh, advantage of this particular uh, caterpillar biomass boom for these broods but uh, now tell me what's happening in the second graph there is a mismatch your uh, caterpillars are deciding to uh, peak in abundance almost nearly midway between both the broods so who is this most advantageous for Neither. It's for the first brood. It will still benefit the first brood. Maybe the, uh, the late brood from the first one may not benefit that much. 
the earliest part of the first brood right right so the overall success rate of these birds is going to drop right because the second brood is definitely not getting at any advantage of uh, this particular caterpillar boom that is happening and in the first peak uh, uh, and of the first batch of uh, clutch that is what is it called yeah the first clutch season it is only the early breeders that are going to gain some advantage of this um, caterpillar boom that is in between both these broods so now given this information what do you think is going to happen the there will be a food shortage among amongst the chicks ma'am and greater competition between parents uh okay let's say a couple of years down the line what do you, what do you think is going to happen how is how are these graphs going to maybe, shift maybe i see there could be two impacts one is the the immediate impact would be the food resources availability for the late broods and all these things which may impact their health or this thing second part they may try to adjust i think towards the uh, the availability resource availability period so laying may change the that may get adjusted in the behavior of the bird Okay. Okay. And what is going to happen? Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. So that's actually exactly what is happening. You know, these birds are uh, laying eggs much earlier in the breeding season. Yes, immediately there will be a population decrease, surely. But definitely, the entire population will not be uh, wiped out because the early breeders will still be successful, right? and uh, over consecutive years these early breeders are going to grow in population and they will give rise to more early breeders right so the entire peak of uh, this first clutch is going to shift a little more uh, towards the uh, left probably they are going to have their peak in breeding sometime during uh mid april to late april and this is actually what is happening um it is even seen in uh, i think uh, migratory birds also migratory birds are altering the time of migration like uh, they are arriving earlier to uh, non breeding sites and earlier to breeding sites the entire like cycle is shifting just based on the fact that resource availability is a major driver right it all boils down to research availability yeah the adult brood birds uh, won't find uh, conducive conditions for a second brood at all and usually they what they will do is, is probably this entire thing is going to shift like the first clutch and the second clutch uh parents need more energy cost for searching brood uh, food yeah sure correct that is what is probably even going to happen in this current situation but over the yeah predation is going to be pretty constant irrespective of whether it is uh, uh eggs are laid earlier or later because predators are always going to be there um but uh, yeah there are going to be some immediate trade offs and later on there are going to be some downstream effects uh yeah govin you have a question i was so uh, what is the is in the graph the second brood even in the first graph would have would not find as much food as the as the first brood right now the second yeah the second brood is not going to find any food because i don't think anything is going to hatch uh, maybe it's going to they are going to the first laid eggs are going to hatch when the caterpillars are getting over so i mean even in the first graph they wouldn't find that much food right now yeah definitely because the late uh, breeders are going to get very less food I'm only the, about the first graph uh yeah of course yeah exactly every bird is not so no i think this is going to so these birds are going to have an onset of food during this period which is uh, 
sl- a slow rise in the peak and by the time this ends there is still going to be an availability of food so the entire uh, early clutch is going to get some food whether it is high or low that is of course variable but uh, the, yeah the point of the second brood is it is it for birds who fail to breed or so not unable to breed so some birds have two clutches some birds only have one clutch mostly birds that breed earlier on in the first uh, uh, brood they will have a second brood and uh, this is probably easier to study in nest box uh, nest box nesting birds like these blue tits because uh, they put up these uh, boxes in these oak trees or whatever large trees are present in this forest and they can monitor it like they can open it they can they can open it from the bottom and they can put their ha- uh, cameras in and check ca- actually count the number of birds but for birds in the wild unless you have a nest that you can monitor without uh, disturbing it it's really difficult to know what is the point of the second brood ma'am the second brood to maximize reproductive success actually i should have but let you answer that no i not that i meant uh, uh, even in even in normal circumstances the second brood would probably would not find as much food so it feels like it there uh, seems more Sure, but what if like a bird has lost all its eggs in or chicks in the first clutch due to some predation event it has the opportunity to nest again and raise another clutch but if that, it is that not was, that, that was my that was my question ma'am that was my original question is this second brood like for the trained breeders or breeders who are... no even successful ones can breed again so ultimately they are Uh, my name is to maximize reproductive success right it's not like oh my two chicks are doing really well now i won't lay eggs again if this uh, conditions are uh, conducive for a second clutch to be f- formed they will have a second clutch yeah but there are uh, at the population level there are perhaps yes definitely some factors that promote more number of second clutches or less number of second So the June one is uh, June one is a chick food needs peak, not a egg laying peak. So why are we talking of two different broods? Early and late brood is only two halves of the same brood. No, actually it's not. Uh, <laughs> the uh, there are two clutches. So th- so this is actually the. birds from this brood have already fledged and it's the same individuals that are nesting again laying eggs again is that is that okay amarna or is this still confusing so that's what govin was also just discussing so they lay eggs twice so the incubation period is about 21 days so within a month in less than a month in 3 weeks the eggs have hatched and the chicks have fledged uh no you can go on right now if you want i you could explain or would you like to take it to the uh discussion forum or something oh okay sure sure maybe you can just uh, type it in and uh, we can discuss uh okay but, uh, but not all birds have the second brood right now yeah yeah not all birds but there are definitely birds that have uh uh second clutches so and they can also be like you have early laying females and late laying females so within this itself you can have like a the birds that breed earlier and instead of a second clutch there are birds that are just breeding once but breeding later right so uh, okay the second the uh, time at which it will go into laying the second clutch yeah often depends on the success or the failure of the first clutch yes sure and the availability of resources also correct so correct resources are not available or conditions are not suitable they sometimes delay the second clutch correct correct and go on so this this graph is from 
a specifically timed study or it is just a representation no no it's a specifically timed study in fact i think they uh, oh i haven't put the reference of this uh, i'll i'll put it in the i'll put it in the presentation when i upload it yeah one more point i have to raise is that small birds have lower incubation periods large birds have larger incubation periods so 21 days is not possible 21 days like pigeons have 18 days so a bird that the size of a tit cannot have uh, incubation period of 21 days plus so minus probably about 2 weeks or 12 days somewhere around that yeah well it's plus minus it's it's like not too much it's not too much of a variation like you won't see a bird incubating for like 30 days or something i mean i don't know about the gib incubation rates but yeah no no like incubation in vultures is sometimes very long okay It sure sure we are talking yeah. about yeah small no, passerines yeah i have a couple of pelicans for okay. 35 days 35 days okay sure sure yeah It's but this very small birds no they cannot have such long yeah. incubation small have the uh, lesser incubation period because they have to fetch uh, food and they have to uh, secure their uh, offspring from the predators and kind sure yeah i i agree i agree on that yeah roughly they say 18 days but yeah smaller birds like passerine birds definitely lesser like you said it, 15 days no sorry yeah what Uh, does it also depend on whether they are precocial or artificial i'm not really sure i think govind you asked this maybe just like you could look it up and let us know if you find some answer to this but uh, i'm assuming precocial birds are little bit larger sized birds also i am not aware of any very small precocial birds i'm not sure i might be wrong yeah grounded i'm not sure about grounded but yeah like usually tits probably yeah 15 15 to 18 days yeah and chicken is like i think 18 to 20 days or something like that so the ashiprinya uh, i have recorded like uh, 15 to 16 days okay yeah, yeah. so small passerines probably yeah probably we we'll, let's say like an average of yeah 15 days uh yeah uh weather also plays a role so the climatic conditions play a role sometimes the hatching rates are later in winter periods and earlier in summer periods for uh, example red avid avids have a hatching rate of 11 days in the summer sometimes even 10 days but in winter then that extends to maybe 13 days 14 days yeah sure but i think like avadavats are granivorous birds and uh, not insectivorous birds so i'm i'm not really sure even what their food uh, food preferences are but this study is basically on temperate uh, uh temperate nesting passerine passeriform birds and this is most uh, often done most of the studies by uh, all the research groups are done on uh nest box species like uh, blue tits or grey tits yeah so i i'm not really sure about like how the tropical bird um egg laying varies but yes it would be highly linked to the presence of uh rain which would basically regulate the onset of uh, insect peaks so that would be the general trend Okay, I'm going to move on. Uh, so, what are Ramsar wetland sites, and which of the following is not a Ramsar site? Govind, you have a question regarding this or the previous one? I have a question. You ask what are Ramsar wetland sites? Yeah. One second. One second. Let maybe just put in your answers first, and then we can discuss. No, I mean the first part of the question was uh, what are Ramsar sites? Correct, correct. Sites? Let's a- answer which of the following are not Ramsar sites first, and then we can discuss what are Ramsar wetland sites. Okay. 
and this is again multiple uh, multiple correct options you could choose whichever you want Ramzan, uh, answer about Ramzan sure, Govind, but just let everyone put in their answers. You, yeah, you, you can, you can give the answer to the first I'm part. Not giving out any options, right? No, just no, no. You can, you, you can give your option. You can put in your option, whatever you feel. Everyone's put in their options. Okay, um, Govind, you haven't put in your. Okay, you have. Okay, you can go ahead and explain what are Ramsar's sites. Uh, Ramsar's sites are sites or wetland sites which are designated as uh, having an international or global importance towards wildlife and conservation. Okay. And and hence, uh, and hence deserve national and even international uh, assistance and prote uh, towards their protection and conservation. Okay. They also uh, are a host for, uh, also considered a host for various critical, uh, critical uh, endangered species uh, also and also global migratory species as well. Okay. Sure. And uh, which of the following is not a uh, Hamzar site? Okay. So everyone definitely says A is not a uh, Ramsar site. Does anyone know where Hesargata Lake is? <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Amarnath says C. Actually, Nalsarovar is a Ramsar site. Uh, does anyone know where Nalsarovar is? Yeah, in Gujarat. Okay. And what about Koleru? Tamil Nadu. Koleru AP. Yes, Andhra Pradesh and, and Pradesh. yeah, uh, Bhitar Kanika. APN Tamil Nadu. No, Bhitar Kanika is not in APN Tamil Nadu. No, no, Kulikat is in APN Tamil Nadu. It, Correct. Between the Correct. APN. What about Bhitar Kanika? Odisha. Okay. Mangos. Yeah. Correct. Okay. So actually, um, uh, Hesargata and Kulikat are not, uh, yeah, Ramsar sites. I actually thought Polygard was a Ramsar site, but it is not. Unless it is just going to be listed as one, but as of right now, it is not a Ramsar site. Okay, uh, so the study done by Priyanka, Ayharan, and D.A. Shankaraman, they looked at how active restoration of re, uh, rainforest patches proved to be beneficial for birds. And they did this real, uh, really interesting study. So these are the graphs that she covered in her, uh, graphs that she explained during her uh, talk. And uh, would someone like to take a stab at explaining uh, what is, what is actually represented in these graphs? So we can first go by the variables of what is listed out there and then we can slowly like break it down. Uh, yeah, I'm sure Govind is ready. Anyone, anyone else would like to take a stab and then Govind can add to it.
no one no one wants to explain anything okay sir so does anyone know what is bm ar and nr these treatment types can someone expand on these treatment types uh, could i do it or should yeah it seems like no one else wants to but yeah sure go in bm stands for benchmark sites okay ar ah. stands for artificially restored yeah uh, nr stands for naturally restored yeah and uh, could you like little bit explain further what are these benchmark sites benchmark sites are the the example sites are like uh, uh, example sites are like if i say in this control sites yes okay. correct control sites and what type of forests are they they are uh, i wouldn't say pristine but they are relatively pristine and healthy forests yeah sure sure yeah correct and what is the difference between actively restored and naturally restored artificially or actively restored refers to uh, uh, anthropogenic assistance to uh, help regenerate the forest whereas naturally restored refers to natural regeneration of the forest yeah correct Okay so you have broadly these three categories that are spread across these two uh blocks uh yeah i think govin you can <laughs> go ahead or this uh, let me just ask does anyone would now like to explain now that you know what these sites are now would you like to explain what do these graphs show yes karnika uh, yeah so uh, in this study they had found that when they made a comparison for the species richness um for uh, the benchmark sites and the uh, active uh, distribution and natural distribution sites in the table and they mapped the species richness they found it was uh, they were roughly the same but when they uh split it they realized that there were there were different patterns for rainforest species and the open country species and uh, it's clear from the graphs that how uh, there were uh, in active restoration areas the species richness was greater than in the naturally restored areas but perhaps it was it was because it was there was special attention that was being given on the active restoration natural restoration um so that has slow okay um so this uh this was this was how uh and again you're taking it to the abundance then uh there were there was a different uh, there was a, like a different uh, result and they found how uh the abundance was different again between green forest and open country species um and here uh, the, the abundance was greater between the ar and nr if i can just use the uh, sure sure yeah 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 go ahead so yeah, so the ar was greater uh, relatively greater than right. the nr yeah and yeah Okay would you like to explain what is actually the difference between rainforest species and open country species Mm Karnika you could go again I, or yeah sure 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 uh, uh, I think uh, for instance uh, some of the species that usually are at the edge of the forest uh, can also be termed as open country species like the brongos and uh, the rainforest species are the species that that prefer canopy cover right sure so these open country species you would find like even in like cities or uh, other habitats that are not as you mentioned close canopy yes. cover habitat types yeah okay uh, cool thanks uh, govil do you want to add something more I'd like to add that oh, 
No overall species species seems uh, relatively similar between the three in in, act in actively restored sites. The number of rainforest species, that is, the species which are you could say are or, or original inhabitants of the dead patches of forest, is greater than the, that of naturally restored uh, nat naturally restoring sites, which would indicate that artificially restored sites are. Not, not up to the benchmarks level, but still uh, superior to the naturally restored sites. While naturally restored sites uh, have greater numbers of uh, open country species, like species which would be present uh, almost anywhere. Right. And so, uh, so, so, what do you, uh, uh, what do you, would, what would be the main take home message from this graph that is shown out here? Active restoration may not be successful, but it certainly uh, is impactful. Okay, and what else? Um, restoration is a very costly and difficult process. Okay, what else? And that rainforest species uh, are uh, much more difficult. I mean, the habitat, for the, the habitat for yes, and the habitat for the rainforest species is um, much more sensitive and harder to restore. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that is uh, that is correct. So it does show that if you go on to do a study and just look at species abundances or richness across all categories, you will see that there is nothing that is changing, right? But only when they split them into rainforest species and open country species did they see a pattern. And they found differences in the type of habitat or the treatment type that is affecting the presence of these particular birds, right? So it does, so you can, you can't really just measure species on the whole. Like you can't club them into just birds because all these birds respond differently to different habitat types so i think uh, that is a very uh, yeah crucial um, take home message from this study that is being done um ar is more suitable to revive rainforest type nr is more suitable yeah correct uh, nr is more suitable to <laughs> revive yeah oh, yeah correct okay sure and open country species are also probably like not uh, native to I don't know if they are looking for restoration of open country species because open country species are present everywhere else apart from in the forest as well. So I think the conservation here is focusing on the rainforest forest species. Yeah. One question here. Yeah. So the goal is to understand how uh, restoration of rainforest patches have impacted birds. Yes, correct. Why was open country species uh, measured? Was for some kind of a comparison to be made? So I think when you are doing like a point count, I mean you include all kinds of birds, right? So whatever you see, you will uh, log. And uh, it also could be possible that you are logging all data first and then you are seeing patterns later. So you don't go in with knowing what you are like of course you have some expectations but uh, more data collection is always better than less data collection right so they could they could they could uh, like it's it's all the matter of what story you are trying to tell so it's not that open country species are not present in rainforests they are also present but how is this uh, active restoration or passive restoration affecting them is also pretty much highlighted in the study itself so, yeah, I don't think you would eliminate, especially when you're doing something like point counts, you would eliminate other, yeah, species. You would, you usually, you count everything that comes uh, or that you see around you, all birds. But probably if you're like mist netting and you're looking for like, for example, avian malaria in Shola endemic species, uh, you would, uh, I think you would still catch other species because you need to know whether these uh, parasites are being uh, transmitted by 
uh, like what are their hosts are they generalists are they specialists so yeah it's more the data the better and then you can draw patterns out of it so can you say that uh, rainforests uh, need uh, efforts for conservation like so this is Since, a study uh, so yeah. so yeah so this is actually a study where they have been doing active restoration and uh, not this study sorry previously like this area in valparai is where they have been doing active restoration for a long period of time and uh, right now they are just looking at in this particular study they have looked at how it affects the bird community yeah so uh, in the artificial restoration uh, the bird number of the species richness has and abundance has increased compared sure. to the natural restoration so sure it needs efforts uh, for conservation yes i mean they would say at uh, active restoration is working better than natural better, restoration yeah. in terms of supporting uh, forest birds yeah that is something that you could uh, draw from this particular study uh rajshia is in different habitat context different type of treatment has to be initiated for conservation uh i am not really sure if i understood your question but uh, yes it probably it everything would be habitat specific so if we are looking at uh, grassland species for example uh yeah you won't find rainforest species there right because uh, there is probably nothing to support the presence of rainforest species there so uh and also the con- conservation i'm not sure how grassland uh, restoration is also done but uh, sure a different type of treatment would would be involved in that uh i think uh, you the a probable study that can be done is looking at like uh, agricultural patches versus grassland patches so uh, you would see a different community of birds in grassland versus i'm sure there are studies that have probably looked into this but i'm not aware uh okay so from the same study uh what does this following ordination plot illustrate does uh, everyone remember from the stats lecture what is an ordination plot Does anyone remember what is uh, an ordination plot? You can say no also in the chat if you don't remember. Okay. Has everyone seen figures like this in uh, several papers? you come across figures like this where you see a number of bunches and then you see like circles around them confidence level uh, sure yeah the circles can be like uh, confidence uh in uh, levels sure uh not only to community data it can be extrapolated to any kind of data you collect like for example i can be collecting uh variables from song data so i can be collecting minimum frequency maximum frequency different kind of things and i'll do an ordination okay so basically ordination data is uh, ordination is something that you do 
when you have a large number of variables collected and you want to minimize that variance to just a few axes right so this ordination usually is happens in it's like orthogonal ordination and you will see various different things like pca plots principal component analysis plots nmds plots nmds is nothing but uh, non metric uh, non metric multi dimensional scaling uh, plots which is done with non parametric data what is non parametric data data that, that is not normally distributed so for data that is uh, normally distributed which follows a normal distribution you would do something like a pca or something but when you have data that is not normally distributed you would do something that like an nmds and basically what you are trying to see is whatever data you have collected uh, whatever variables you are collected from different let's say for, uh, taking this example from different treatment sites how are they uh, panning out in terms of their variance and are they clustering together so uh, basically each point that you see is a site and each site has a number of vegetation variables so uh, this particular uh, paper looked at uh, several vegetation variables does anyone men, men, uh, remember what all vegetation variables they used for analyzing their plots for forest structure so basically they used uh, uh, variables like tree height tree height is like from top to bottom the tree height basal area does anyone know what is basal area has anyone heard of the term gbh or dbh Okay, so this is basically girth at breast height or diameter at breast height. So this is a measurement taken about uh, four feet from the ground or something like similar to that, and you take the measurement across all the trees in that area to estimate basal area, so the amount of area that the tree occupies, right? Then you have canopy cover. So canopy cover is data collected usually by like some uh traditionally like now you have apps to estimate canopy cover but usually they had like a mirror like thing which they would hold and it would reflect the canopy into it and that is completely gridded so you would count the number of grids that are covered by the canopy and estimate the percentage of canopy cover in that area then they looked at tree species richness which is basically the number of Uh, species of trees that are present in the area tree density amount of area that it occupies leaf litter depth which is basically showing the amount of organic matter that is present uh, above the soil uh, then you have canopy overlap is probably the percentage of canopies that are overlapping uh, across trees and then they looked at veg, uh, vertical stratification so at levels maybe like they took some measurements at uh, 5 meters 15 meters uh, 5 10 15 i'm i'm not really sure but yeah so when you have so many variables and you're looking for patterns what you try and do is an ordination which basically reduces the number of variables that can be visualized in a graph so if you have eight variables you can't look at eight axes right it's difficult to view a uh, 2d uh, an 8d plot right this is a 2d plot if you add one more axis it will be a 3d plot even 3d plots are very difficult to read forget i think about uh, the other uh, types of plots so basically what these ordination plots do they reduce the variance to re be represented in usually the first two axis 
right so all the variance across all these variables is represented in these two axes and each plot each point represents a value of those eight variables for that site across all these eight variables right and then you will see a sort of clustering pattern so this clustering pattern shows that uh, in the benchmark sites you don't need to get into details but it basically shows that variables in the benchmark sites are very similar to each other so they are clustering together right the uh, actively restored sites uh, variables for vegetation structure falls in this uh, blue green circle out here and for the uh, naturally restored sites they fall in this uh, yellow circle out here and what you can see is that the vegetation of forest structure in uh, actively restored and uh, naturally restored sites are overlapping with each other there are still some some points that are not overlapping with each other within these confidence uh, ellipses that are shown here but there are some that are falling in between so we can see that the benchmark sites are highly distinct from each other in forest structure is is this kind of uh, clear or understandable we don't need to go into like further details the press time remains press time and the interventions remain uh, no so pro probably over time like uh, you might see these actively restored or naturally restored plots reaching this level of vegetation structure like the purple circle for the benchmark sites but as of now it is clustering differently so this actually shows there is a difference in vegetation structure itself or forest structure between these plots that does influence the presence of birds and you might be wondering how does vegetation structure influence the presence of birds but structure is really important because a uh, structure defines a lot of things could you could you guess for example what structure would uh, define niches sure niches of niches of shelter and food yes correct yeah that is that is correct so size size of birds yeah uh, yeah i think the first two points that you made are like very crucial so uh, nesting space people uh, not people uh, certain birds prefer certain uh, uh, stratification of canopy yeah certain like uh, what is it called they uh, they have some criteria to habitat selection for nesting purposes right and if that is not met if they don't have like crevices or holes or understory or coverage or something birds that nest in that kind of habitat would not be present in that kind of uh, site right so and also resource availability now how is resource availability driven you can find insects at various different vertical stratification and depending on the structure of the forest presence of insects will be more or less right and if that is the particular food source for these uh, insectivorous birds then they will be present or absent yeah so uh, uh, correct for aging niches okay cool so i hope that was um, this is not changing that was clear okay so the bugun leo sikla sichla i think it is is found in a tiny range restricted area that includes the village called the
okay so everyone's got that right uh, the uh, the correct answer is indeed uh, singchun uh, village okay so a little more about the bird uh, you could start filling it in the chat so dr uh, ramana athreya is from aisar pune and he is an astrophysicist who also does a lot of work on birds and moth and how uh, climate change and land use change affects presence of uh, species so he first saw this in 1996 uh, and then finally got it when Okay, when did he? Does anyone remember the year when he caught this? When he caught this? Two thousand six. Right. So he caught it in two thousand six, and uh, uh, could someone tell me a little bit about the species? It had both unique song types and uh, unique appearance, which is what led to its classification as a species. Yeah, I shouldn't be showing actually the next question part, right? Because that's just going to be answered. Uh, okay. So, what is uh, unique about uh, now? Since that is answered, uh, what is unique about its plumage and so? Yeah, that is really impo- important that the locals did not distinguish it as different. So that is uh, yeah. I'm not sure why. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah. Do you know why? Well, I am. No, I do not know why. I am just guessing. It's a uh, has a small bird, right, ma'am? Uh, sure. If it's a small bird and it's but it's range restricted and found only in that area, they would definitely and people in the forest are very very observant. Like uh, they know. But all well, the words I, and what everything sounds like also so they are quite sharp i get that very much but since it's a very small bird that does not have this does not uh, how do i say you provide that much importance maybe ma'am it's not given much importance because of its small size and lack of uh, sufficient observable impact uh i'm i'm Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if size could be a factor. Uh, I mean, it it definitely. I mean, it definitely. Even the plumage. So if it was like probably like a drab colored bird, small, it's more likely to be uh, not noticed than a brightly colored bird like this. But why do you think a brightly colored small bird was not noticed? So yes, uh, it is definitely a very narrow. Uh, uh, and range restricted bird and yeah it is endemic to only yeah so basically there are very few individuals right so they probably would not have been seen because they are so few in number so uh, it is possible that there uh, that they might be a bit more abundant than we might think but then since the the forest itself there is quite thick and lush and the species is a rather small bird which might just be confused with the different species in a flock yeah sure uh, that that uh, that could be a possibility uh, I, i i feel that the species is range seems too restricted i think it seems excessively small even for that species uh no it's probably like if it's a territorial species it won't have a large range and uh, we don't know what are the factors that it is tracking right they might be like a matrix of factors of temperature climate habitat that it is tracking at such a fine scale that is not allowing it to uh, expand further out of that area and also most of the areas in the northeast have not been explored so if there is some systematic study going on i'm not sure if there has been uh, to look specifically for the bird uh, you might like find more of them in number 
but so far from whatever has been done it is found to be a very uh, range restricted bird yeah uh, so, i came across a paper on this today only there are seven different species and all of them are highly endemic right they are all highly endemic to wherever they are and that is at some uh, they are spread across a very wide distance and region sure i i think this one though looks similar to one of the other uh, leo cichlus species i'm chinese, i'm not sure chinese one right sorry the chinese one version right yeah yeah i i, I can't remember yeah so it's... that could be the reason that uh, there are other species in the nearby region which are endemic as mark has mentioned um, people might not pay much attention whether some population has just new in this forest and whether they are same or not because even uh, uh, adresa did not publish i think that they discovered a new species until uh, they confirmed that it is really a different species right yeah yeah and uh, also like uh, to identify it for sure you need to have i think this was identified without uh, genetic data but based on the feather samples so that was a crucial part of uh, identification along with of course the song but um, yeah the, the differences were less but large enough for it to be classified as a another species altogether and uh, i'm not sure if any genetic studies have been done with the collected feathers or not i am not aware but you can get dna from feathers so i'm not sure if that has been done uh okay so basically this is a very range restricted bird has a very uh, small habitat and if uh, any alterations are done to its habitat it is likely to get extinct but uh, yeah i think it was one of like the pretty cool discoveries of late and also in the northeast um there are there's such a high diversity of birds probably someone would not notice yeah a bird that uh, has a different song or something like that because uh, there are several birds out there that sing a lot uh okay so does anyone know what is a holotype so in taxonomy there are different types that are classified based on the uh, first species. specimen to describe the species uh yeah uh, i'm not uh, yeah it need, need not i think be the first but it is the species that one particular individual that is used to uh describe the species type so all the characteristics of the species are described on the basis of that one specimen which is known as the holotype so this particular bird species that was used as a holotype in uh ramana study i think is a male uh, bogun leo cichla yeah and uh, does anyone know what an isotype is was it the the, the species with the same name as the uh, genus or something uh no it's actually uh, <laughs> good guess but uh, it's actually as this as as another specimen of the same kind so usually people will collect a lot more uh, so not not in so if you go to museums uh, you will find like several different uh, individuals of a particular species but the first uh species based on what the thing is described on species it is described on is known as the uh, holotype and then any other thing that is uh uh spe- specimen that is caught at that time a duplicate specimen that is known as a isotype 
you mean holotype is an actually an individual yes one okay. single individual one right. specimen so an entire species is described on one specimen known as a holotype of course like uh, if they are male and females they will include descriptions by uh, uh, other individuals also caught but usually it is yagovin this is by what you can there be a difference between can there be a difference between male and female holotype yeah usually there will be right like uh, because if they are dimorphic in nature there will be differences between male and female this holotype individual that you describe yeah. is based on the fact that this was the first individual that was caught and studied or it was i mean from a range of specimens this was decided to be the best example of its species yeah that i am it it i would assume it is the first individual i would assume it is the first individual but i don't know if they caught like yes. a bag of birds and picked one from that i think it actually is the first individuals first individuals species uh, from an area right uh, caught for describing that species right like an uh, introducing the species to the yeah to a new uh, yeah classification to classification in case of extinct species the holotype might be different between the first right uh it will probably be the first fossil Artists? discovered yeah the first fossil yeah, discovered example, for example uh, if a fossil if a first fossils are discovered are actually fragments which are not very complete but the second uh, fossil discovered is much more complete more than the second one we can say the holotype uh well you probably don't know what you are looking at till you get like the entire thing right or enough nowadays you have like enough computational techniques and uh, yeah pre creating techniques to figure out what could be fitting where but uh, i i have i have no idea whether but ideally i would say it should be like the one specimen chosen whether it is the first or not is uh, i'm not uh, sure of but yeah something that gives you a holistic picture of what the specimen could be one question you what would you do with this information i mean today if i had to do a speciation study and separate one subspecies then mm-hmm. i would compare it to its nominate subspecies Supposing I am studying wagtails, sure. I will look at Montacilla alba alba, and then I will separate the Personata and Chinese and different races sure. based on sure. this. Sure. So what am I going to do with this information about what? What are we supposed to do with? All <laughs> what are you going to do with all this information? This you should ask to all biogeography people. <laughs> so no, anybody? I mean, because this is not the. We don't it, like you said, right? This is the first individual sees. Sure. So it may not be a very good representation of its own race and species, also. Oh, so you're talking like, about like variation, but it's actually giving you a picture, right, of what that there is a new species. It's not the same species. There are there is. It's not just a single species, but there are actually two species that are present out here. It's different. It's not the same. So you're adding to the you diversity. But not know anything because this is the very first individual caught. So this may be a juvenile. It That's okay. That's else, okay. What will you do with? You know that there is a new species that has been discovered. So genetically, if you fit it into the G uh, of any phylogenetic tree, it will not cluster with other species. It will cluster as a new species, and then people will mostly go ahead and try and find out like. what is the species why does it exist there what are the factors that have led it to split from another species how to conserve it how much is the population population estimation so it's like a whole downscale uh, process so i'm not sure if your question is why should we discover new species or no no it's got nothing to do with this discovery of the species is the value of classifying one individual as a representative of its whole genus or species I mean, no, if you I'm don't have anything else, so many a times I feel. No, supposing uh, if a taxidermist had ten different individuals caught, yeah, and then he selected this one individual to be the holotype. Yeah, for me that has more value than you having misnated and just caught one individual, and now you have described the whole species based on that one individual that you happen to catch. Sure, 
sure i mean one. i mean if it is present in large numbers people will definitely catch more than one but it is described on the basis of one because you can't include so much variation in your description right so if you i i don't know how taxonomy functions but uh, there have been things that have been mis uh, identified and misclassified like just recently i think there was an article for i can't remember which museum but they had actually had gotten a specimen of a golf ball and classified as a new fungus right so you do have things like this happening and uh, it still sits in a museum but everyone knows that it is a whatever degenerated golf ball and not a, a new type of fungus so whatever information you are getting is great irrespective of whether it is less or not but i think for taxonomy purposes you need to have like a holotype to describe yeah the species i don't know why it is only one specimen but there must be some logic to it but it's uh, it's probably like a uh, uh, good uh, good if you would like to uh, yeah uh, read up on it and uh, also like share with others but probably if you need to taxonomy you need to name it on something right so uh, to name the species you need to have a description and that is probably based on that whatever description you get uh, out of that one species but i am not sure if you catch only a juvenile of the particular species how that works so yeah uh yeah sachin so oh, my take on this classification or naming basically would be But probably when it all started earlier, we might not have so much abundance of the species. So I think abundance is the uh, point that I wanted to think upon in it. That if there are many species, as you said rightly, uh, yeah, you may capture and then put one individual as the uh, 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 representative of that class, yeah. but uh, uh, species basically. Yeah. But if we don't know, then it, like starting somewhere and that. milestone i think has been renamed as holotype for example Correct. we may get uh, some meteor uh, rock or something and then based on that data we keep on digging what are the contents where it might have come from what is the location of all these things it might lead to something else like that my take on the yeah. nomenclature of the holotype and isotypes sure yeah and there are th- thousands of different types like it's just not like holotype and isotype i think there's neotype allotype whatever different types and based on more information collected it is added on to the description of the species but for the very first probably like discovery of a new species you need to have it based on something so yeah that is the holotype just to add to what sachin ji said the only this week i came to know that in the 1930s there was an ornithologist who collected so many species they have not been able to catalog it up till now is it in birds or whole collection to the us okay his name was walter boels okay what was he collecting it, was it plants or animals no no birds okay birds okay more than 60000 birds were collected okay and up till now they have not been able to catalog the whole collection okay so a lot of also this is done in order to get recognition and you know for scientists to be the very first one to have identified and sure. recognized and established their name sure so there are other things also involved in these kind of things you know uh, sure yeah there is uh, definitely an underlying thing to it but yeah i did not know of this uh, person who has collected samples so uh, any which region like is it from india or like some southeast asian All country across the Indian subcontinent. And okay. It seems it's lying in a museum in the U.S. I've not gone into details of it, but Walter Powell's, if you check, uh, is the he was a zoologist, botanist, and used to collect uh, specimens. It's lying in the University of Michigan museum now. Okay. And so the collection is being gradually catalogued, understood, and it seems like today, if you have to say that you have discovered a new species in India, you cannot say that until you first go and compare it with. is uh, the specimen that he has collected in the 1930s and only then do we know that this is now new for india yeah. because how do we know we have to have some past survey you have to have Definitely. the earliest survey or census done and then do a comparison for that 
So, uh, excuse me. So, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah uh, the person in 1930s might have collected the species, but he hadn't yet described it. When you describe it, then it becomes, uh, you'll get to know it is a new species. Then it becomes a prototype. Whether it can be in 1930s or in 2020. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I agree with that. Yeah. All right. I'm going to go to the next question. So, has anyone heard of the Sloss debate for conservation planning? You can say no also. Okay. Uh, yeah, Govind. Is this planning uh, related to whether uh, uh, a single large patch should be established or whether several small patches should be established? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is with relation to whether a single large patch is better than several small patches or vice versa. Yes. So in this we have heard about. I have, okay. I have heard about it. Okay. I haven't heard about the name, but I know about the. Uh, the yeah, process. so it's it's very obvious, like right? It's S L O S S, Sloss debate. Single large or several small. So it's just uh, condensed to that. Yeah, I don't know if this is covered or not, but I thought uh, it would be interesting. I didn't I didn't come across it uh, in the lectures, but. Uh, it probably might have been there, but covered in another uh, term. Yeah. So, Govin, do you do you want to like uh, like take a stab? The debate is uh, the debate is about whether the a single large patch would be more beneficial for a species which is in abundance over several small patches. I think the understanding is that a single large patch would be superior to several small fragmented patches because a single large patch has a high amount of core area species as well, whereas several small uh, uh, patches have uh, have rather small uh, species in the core area, whereas uh, species in the edges are much higher. Yeah. So the, the proportion of species uh, is more is more evenly balanced and higher in single large patch. Right, sure. Also, probably, the, probably the addition to that would be, I mean, the theory of island, I think, right? When there are smaller islands which are farther, we have seen that there are there is a richness or maybe there is endemism to it. So, probably that's what I think the debate might have come to. I mean, just seeing the diagrams, I can correlate it to those islands. Yeah. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah, sure. I remember now, Mami, I saw this in Jobis lecture. Oh, did Jobis. he cover this last time? Yes, I oh. did it, Oh, yes, I see, yes. I see. Okay, okay. <laughs> I, I did not, I, I didn't uh, see what he had done. Okay. Was it the same thing or did he like show something else? Well, the, this uh, diagram you're showing right now is the same thing. Right okay, now. so the left it's and the right one. Okay, so would anyone like to just like summarize this? Could I, ma'am? I remember the... Yeah, sure. Condition. The first comparison, a single large or a single small. Uh, obviously, a single large patch would be superior to a single small patch due to the greater size, greater resources. Ah. And the second comparison, a uh, single large or uh, versus several small. A single large patch is better to than the several small patches, as I've already mentioned. Better core area species, then better balance of species with species richness. The third, uh, the third comparison: small patches uh, close together or small patches away from each other. Uh, Forest patches which are clustered together are, are better since they have greater interaction and connectivity than a, la than a, a larger than patches which are further away. The fourth comparison, 
patches which are connected are better than patches which are not connected as patches which are connected have can have species can have birds and species which move in between the patches whereas those which are not connected are isolated the fifth comparison is whether a circular patch is better than a linear patch or not a circular patch is better because again similar to the similar to the previous debate on whether a single large or single small a, a circular patch has an even distribution of both core area and uh, edge species whereas a linear patch uh, has as a excessive amount of edge related species or forest edge species whereas the uh, ones in the core area are relatively small the last one buffer yeah buffer area I'm not just so sure about the last one. I can't remember. Okay, so usually would a- anyone like to take a stab at that? Yeah, buffer zones uh, are preferred. Uh, I mean, um, so what is a buffer zone? Zones. Yeah, so the activity can be restricted in the core zones, and the uh, activity can uh, limit in the uh, in the buffer zones. Right. So there is like a gradient. right so you have a core zone that yeah. remains like undisturbed and then you have a buffer zone yeah. where there is some amount of activity involved so the buffer zone the uh, areas with buffer zones are most likely to be protected because people will still have access to resources present in forest in the buffer zone as opposed to completely being uh, you know the a complete area being cordoned off and uh, usually if complete areas are cordoned off especially for people who depend on forest for their livelihoods it is going to result in some amount of conflict so that's why yeah this is one of the reasons why buffer zones are important okay so um, i think it's uh, and the uh, debate can go either ways depending also on the species because um, for example species like large species can probably travel between forest patches birds can fly they can fly between patches but for some species that needs um a continuous habitat to be present to uh, uh, uh to not migrate to move between areas they need to have corridors. some amount of yeah corridors yeah correct they need to have these corridors to maintain some amount of connectivity uh okay so uh so these are different uh, techniques for conservation of species and a long term preservation strategy for conservation of some critically endangered species would involve what keeping them in botanical gardens cryo preservation techniques having them in zoological parks or uh having them in wildlife safari parks does anyone know hmm uh did you say if it includes more than one uh, yeah sure if you want to like keep them i uh, more than one or just one all of the above okay sure all of the above the option missing which should have been here is captive breeding okay so sure breeding in breeding birds and birds or uh, yeah so they are revived and their population is revived by captive breeding projects not by you cannot restrict a bird to a wildlife safari park and think that it will remain there it's not an enclosure right sure so Okay. Uh, okay. So the answer here is actually uh, cryo preservation te- uh, techniques. Does anyone know what is cryo preservation techniques for those that have answered? Yes. Correct. Cryo preservation. Yeah. 
has not succeeded till date. Are there any examples? Ah uh, yes, uh, like rice and uh, a lot of plant matter has is stored in cryopreservation banks. I was thinking in the context of birds. Ah uh, well, not in probably birds, but uh, it's a futuristic view of conservation. Like we will do this today in hopes that we, the technology will evolve. Sure. Be successful enough in the future to uh, sure. succeed with it. Correct. That is a very optimistic way of feeling. <laughs> sure, Mark. But I'm sure you, what people must have expected hundred years ago and thought it was very futuristic, is actually what we are living with right now. So, yeah. Technology. Actually, the mammoths, uh, like uh, after the ice age. Uh, that was the actual uh, background uh, uh, information for this. Uh, I mean, uh, ideology for this uh, cryopreservation. Right, so because of uh, store yeah. it in the lower temperatures. And, uh, yeah, yeah. So actually, as Tarak uh, explains out here, it is uh, you sh uh, store germ plasm in liquid nitrogen, and people can like freeze eggs and sperms also of uh, various different animals. Uh, yes. Uh, well, they are they are dormant. Yeah, in deep freeze for storage or preservation. Yeah, but it's usually yeah. stored in liquid nitrogen, which is I think it has it's at minus one ninety six or something. Um, yeah. So does that uh, Svalbard seed vault or whatever uh, maybe in the northern Europe? Yeah, I yeah there the is a seed thing? bank. Yes, yes, yes. I think so. I am not. Uh, it's probably that. And in that seed bank also, they have to periodically germinate some of the seeds because they keep failing. So that entire batch then has to be disposed of because uh, periodically they keep discovering that some of them don't germinate and don't successfully uh, grow out. Also. So they have to keep validating it's that bank. Like, uh, it's called like a shelf life or testing the shelf life. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you can't just like freeze it forever and forget about it. It's an active research center. Yeah. So let's test. Govind, your voice is very faint. I'm going to ask Ravan to make a point. Yeah. I mean, if you were saying something, or else, like Govind, maybe just a little bit louder. It's very faint at my end. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Say, can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, okay. I am not. Yeah, I don't know of where it originated from, but yeah. Okay. Okay. Hey, your voice is like, yeah, as if you are speaking on the other side of a tunnel. I don't know, it seems to be fainter than what it was earlier, but yeah, I, I've heard, yeah, you could probably just type the name in the chat box. Nikolai, I think I heard. Uh, okay, uh, can it be only for dead specimen? No, they are live tissues. They are live. They are live cells actually that are put under these cold conditions and they remain dormant. So uh, I'm not sure if you know about like microbiology studies. Like for example, it's very easy to do uh, population studies with bacteria and small single cell organisms because you can just stick it in a freezer and it's going to its growth rate is going to be arrested. But the minute you take it out of the freezer and put it under suitable uh, living conditions, you can uh, revive it. So they are like all live specimens. Yeah, even uh, if uh, in vitro storage of like eggs and sperm, they like this is how it like these uh, gene banks function. So you store them under cold conditions, like we were just discussing about those. Uh, 
was it northern white rhinos and this is what they have been doing for this species that is extinct in the wild they have the eggs of the rhino stored and they have the sperms of uh, the last male that was stored and they are trying to uh, see if they can uh, create a viable uh, zygote and then uh, introduce it into another species that is uh, that can uh, probably uh, um, Amen. grow the rhino. Yeah. Yeah, go with yeah. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, I got the name Nikolai Vavilov. Bab- cool. Well, I was going to mention that there are animals that can actually breathe over and still survive. Yeah, there are. Probably, yeah, there definitely are because people, uh, not people, uh, there, there are definitely uh, organisms that uh, undergo hibernation and various stages of hibernation. So, no, I mean, like, organisms, uh, animals that can actually freeze solid and still, still survive. Okay, cool. Yeah, good to like, know. Like, uh, an example would be wood frogs. Yeah. Wood frogs, they live in the. Uh, the northern parts of North America, ma'am, they, uh, unlike other frogs which which have to burrow deep underground to survive, they they survive by by actually, uh, they do burrow underground but not enough to avoid freezing. So, so they, yeah. when winter comes, they burrow they, and they lay still and then the, when the cold snow comes in, they literally freeze solid. like. Yeah. Really solid, and at this in this stage they are as close to death as possible. Now, their brain stops functioning, their heart stops beating, most of the body functions are uh, in suspended animation. The only thing that keeps them going, uh, keeps them going, is the uh, is our, our sugars that they use to like protect their vital parts of the body from the ice crystals, which could otherwise cause damage. These sugars they form a sort of protective coating over these over their vital areas uh, and at the same time also serve as energy uh, serve as energy to keep the frog just beyond death and when the free, uh, and the ice melts away the frog revives and it goes back to nothing cool yeah thanks thanks for that information also um, water bears can also survive as well have you heard of dark rates man uh, yeah, but I think we uh, should not discuss that now because we are all over time and uh, we will meet next week for uh, the final, uh, the last uh, discussion session. So yeah, thanks for joining in today and uh, see you all next week. And I'll put in the exam query. Yeah. Uh, yes, Karnika. Just a quick question. Um, you said... Uh, we're going to meet the final time next week, which means next Tuesday. Correct. Yeah, I will have a class uh, next Tuesday and Jobin will have right. this week. Yeah, 21st. Yeah. Right. Um, and uh, uh, since it's, it's, I have attended really few uh, Tuesdays and Fridays, unfortunately, because it's six to eight on weekdays are um, no problem. Yeah, are hard for me. Uh, so, um, I thought before, um, I do not know if it's already discussed, I'm sorry if it's a repetitive question, but I just wanted to, for my own clarity, uh, it is going to be a multiple choice uh, examination, multiple choice question examination for two hours. I um, don't actually have a hundred questions or what is it because Jobin was trying to answer it but then there was there was no there was not enough clarity at that moment time the last time I did the session. Oh. So you or anyone else in the Does the anyone else know? Well, that's what that's what Jobin said that because it's not easy to manage uh, the subjective uh, questions and all these things. So all questions will be multiple choice questions. And yes. Yes. 100 or so? I don't remember exactly because 100 points are what is mentioned in uh, actually, the format. Uh, actually, I'm not sure on the number of questions, but it was mentioned that it will include both multiple multiple choice and distributed questions. No, the, the, point, the point is that the, that's actually a common email that goes to goes for, goes out for all the courses. And for <coughs> ornithology, because Chetty, I think, and Jobin are only the maybe. I don't know, coordinator or evaluator. And Sonia as well. Yeah, Sonia. They, they know the 
exactly this. Uh, yeah, clearly we don't. But even I thought it was like an MCQ and a uh, descriptive one. But we'll probably just uh, I'll just ask these uh, the uh, coordinators and I'll ask them whether it is a MCQ or a, or a descriptive one. And uh, what is when are they giving the uh, sites? Uh, the what is it locations? Uh, what is it exam centers? Sorry. Yeah. Hall tickets. Uh, hall tickets. Yeah, yeah. That will come with the uh, yeah whenever. But it should come like soon enough. One more point, uh, Chiti. Yeah. There have been the uh, dashboard has not been updated for the live sessions after fifth of April. Uh, so I was going through the quiz today and I found that okay, there are t- questions in this quiz which have not been covered in the lectures. Then I realized that it is part of a live session that I have missed. Oh, I see. Then okay. I that that the, there have been it has not been updated for the live sessions after the fifth of April. The fifth of April is the last live session that was. Okay, I am uh, I am con- uh, confused. Are you talking about uh, live sessions where the faculty are interacting? Yes. Okay. Uh, cool. I'll uh, ask someone about that. Also, uh, Mark, just please post that on the discussion forum as well, because okay. probably like yeah. Sonia might be quick to uh, yeah she'll be able to help you on that. But yeah, just just post that. Right. Yeah. What you do find? Uh, would you put that in the discussion forum? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, uh, Karnika, just post it on the discussion forum if you haven't posted sure. it till now, and then. Not haven't posted it yet. Yeah, yeah. Just post it, and then we'll just like respond to that and send it to everyone. Thank you so much. Cool. All right. Uh, see you all next week. Thanks for joining. Bye.